7th to be extraordinarily accurate. Guy Adami here. Dan Nathan there. Today's market call brought to you by CME Group, Dan, where risk and fact meets opportunity. We're powered by Open Exchange. I'm powered by the notion that for the last two weeks or so, I've been not in Italy, Dan, but in Sicily, as I'm sure you've mentioned a number of times, but I am thrilled times. to be back here on the market call. Oh, by the mm. way, I think we have new graphic package. Is that the right way to say it? Graphic package? No, that's that's coming to a theory near you. Oh. Guy, guys like that guy on the street corner hears something, repeats it. Right. You know what I mean? Exactly and then, right. and, yeah, and so then, like a, a former you know, president. Guy, hey, sorry about that. That's how rumors get started. By the way, that was a great, I tell you, an underrated, and, and one of those albums that is overrated as it is, I think it's underrated. Uh, big Fleetwood that? Mac fan, by the way. I'm, Back I'm, to you. I'm by no means a, a Fleetwood Mac fan. And, and quick shout out, guys. It is amazing to have you back. We missed you. Our viewers missed you. No, they didn't. But we got to give thanks. Carter Braxton, where it did some serious heavy lifting. Danny Moses from mm -hmm. our On The Tape podcast stepped in. Liz Young was amazing. Um, so we had Vinny and Porter. Um, uh, no, we didn't. That was on, on the tape. No. Um, but just kind of getting you all excited here. But we had a lot of help. All right. Let's do it, guy, because it was exactly, exactly two weeks since you left us. Mm -hmm. And the markets, all different markets. You, you know, when we talk about the markets, we usually talk about the equity markets. But everything kind of went haywire since you were gone here, and we just had to kind of just. <laughs> oh no! I, I can't can breathe. I, that's from, you know, I like that song. I think that's from the Pitch Perfect soundtrack, if yeah, I'm not mistaken, been. the first one. <clears throat> and I love the fact that she called herself Fat Amy. They actually said that in the movie. Yeah, no, she was great. Um, here, here's one of the things that was really interesting about that that day two weeks ago that you left. We had that huge down day in the stock market. It was yeah. one of those days that really kind of, I think, shook investors. You know, we had kind of been in this drawdown. It was lasting a few weeks after that huge rally that we had in the summer. But it was also, look what happened in the dollar over the last two weeks since you've been gone. Look what happened in crude oil. Look what, I mean, we didn't even put gold in there, but you see 10-year yields here. What is your take, guy? You took a step back. I know you were watching markets. I know you were watching headlines. You certainly had a lot to say on the Twitter the day that the Fed came out here. But sometimes taking a step back from staring at your fact set machine all day long is, is actually pretty useful for mm -hmm. trying to get, get, a, get a sense for where we are. What do you think's happened in the last couple of weeks and where do you think we are? So let me address, I think that's a, that's a fantastic point that sometimes you need to sort of take a step away because it really helps clarify things. So for you and I and a lot of people, we stare at this stuff all day long and you can easily get caught up in the day-to-day -day moves, the, the minute-to-minute -minute moves, and it can really cloud your judgment and sometimes make you question yourself. And rightly so, you should always be questioning yourself. But when <clears throat> you take a step back and you're able to look at things from sort of a 30,000 foot uh, directive or perspective, it makes things a lot clearer, I think. All the things that you thought were happening actually become crystallized and those sort of moves like we saw this morning to the upside. Did that make sense? No, not to me particularly, but it helps you to sort of, I think, get clarity. So it, it's good to sort of step away from time to time just to sort of recalibrate. In terms of what I think has happened, it's what's been happening all along. The market structure, and Danny Moses talks about this a lot, is effectively broken. And you know, when you had 12 years or so, 13 years of easy money, it makes things opaque. There's no way to have true price discovery. And now as we're trying to get ourselves out of that correctly, by the way, price discovery is becoming a thing. But the path to price discovery is extraordinarily difficult. And I think that's what we're in the midst of right now. Well, I'll tell you one thing. <clears throat> Investors who are skeptical that rates would go up in a meaningful manner, um, you know, are seeing what price discovery looks like firsthand. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you think about just kind of overnight the price action we've seen in like, let's say the 10 year yield and how the the futures were kind of keying off of that and, and the sort of movements that we've had, it, it's pretty fascinating right now, Guy. Um, so let's just take a look though at the S&P futures here, man. Like, you know, again, we know that we're flirting with those June lows. Um, you know, you see that series 
of lower highs and lower lows. And I thought this tweet, this is by a gentleman named Jonathan Harrier. He has a mm. CMT. He's got those letters after his name. So he is definitely worth watching Does that here, mean like cool mother something? Or yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Certified yeah. market something? Whatever. Technician. All right. Yeah. So he's a technician. But this tweet is really interesting. Fewer than 5% of the SPX, SPY stocks finished above the respective 50-day simple moving average for the second day in a row back to November of 1985. This happened 85 other times. He's put together a table of prior events and following returns. All 85 events were higher one year later. That's pretty. That's an interesting stat. I mean, I, I, I'm assuming it's true. He's got the CMT uh, name after that. But, Guy, really quickly, when you look at the S&P futures and backing out five years, we've been talking about this kind of 3,630 range down to 3,430. That was the pre-pandemic high in the S&P 500. It really feels like if we break... We go lower. There's an air pocket there down to those pre-pandemic highs. And we also know that there's plenty of stocks that are well below. We were talking about Adobe after their disappointing results that are below their pandemic crash lows here. So my question to you is that data set phenomenal. I think a very different time you know, right now. What's your thoughts on when you see a piece of data like that that suggests we're going to be higher a year from now? But like, given what we know, what's right in front of us, it's hard to see that. Yeah. So a year from now, listen, so let's play it out. Uh, let's, let's say Halloween of next year, where are we? Are we higher from that? Yes, because if you look historically, yeah. obviously the market tends to go higher. It's just how do we get there? And I know that's being overly simplistic. But that's really the argument, right? It's easy to say history suggests that in a year from now, based on these facts, the market is higher. And if it's true, I'll take his word for it. It's just how do we get there that's going to be the question. And I think we get there by going lower first. And by the way, yep. I do happen to think we're probably going to get there. I actually thought if you asked me this this time last year, I thought we'd see the precipitous sell-off that we saw that we're in the midst of, I just thought we would rally a lot sooner towards the end of the year. That's not manifesting itself yet. So it's sort of playing out longer than I thought it would. But there's a very good chance that by this time next year, the world looks significantly different. I think inflation will be, I don't want to say under control to 2%, but it'll be under control much more so than it is now. And you might have a Federal Reserve that by then is taking their foot off the gas in terms of tightening and maybe going the other way. Maybe you're starting to see a bounce in earnings. The world is through. There are a number of different things that can go right to get us there. Again, to answer your question is how do we get there? And those yeah. horizontal lines that you drew in the green with that gray area in between. Dan, you've been drawing those lines since December uh, of last year, January of this year. And we've talked about how it's almost an inevitability that in the environment that we found ourselves in then and currently find ourselves in, we will test those levels. And I'm not going to sway from that. And I'm not going to be uh, taken off that perch. I do think that 3,400 <clears throat> is at some point in the cards. And uh, clearly, I think it's going to happen uh, over the next couple of months. Right. And and I guess we've been trying to put like a multiple for the S&P mm -hmm. as far as earnings and where we think earnings growth is going to be. And let's just say you want to be for next year, um, very conservative. I think a consensus right now is for 240. Um, let's say it's 220 and put a 15 multiple on that. You get to a 30, 30, 300, put a 14 multiple on it and you get to, you know, a little below 3100. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, we're seeing all sorts of targets being ratcheted down here. Um, yeah. And to the point about that tweet. OK, so um, what what it's trying to suggest is that we have all these stocks that are very oversold and 85 times we've had this exact occurrence two days in a row below that 50-day simple moving average a year later the market is up well you know flip a coin right here and we're down 25 percent i don't think that is um that hard to suggest that we would be so to your point guy adami at some point all of these things that have rattled equity markets that have caused yields to go where they are the dollar to go where it is you know you know a lot of these other macro assets as it really to commodities and such, you know, ultimately, let's all hope that things have settled down a little bit. But the one thing, guy, and you kind of been all over this one, is yields in particular here. Mm -hmm. And let's just talk about, you know, the, the pace in which the 10-year has bounced off of 2.5%. This was in early August. And now here we are. We are knocking at the door of 4% here. I think you thought we were going to go and break out above 3.5%. But this feels a little steep here, a bit of a blow off. Yeah. Thoughts? Uh, on this, on the, on the yields. You know, I tell you what, it's it's actually, there are a lot of things to think about here, but it's somewhat scary that 
you know, the market selling off. This is what I thought would happen. So let's play it from that angle and then we'll back into this answer. I thought the market would sell off, but I thought you'd see a commensurate move of flight to quality in the form of bonds, which would make yields go lower. But what we're seeing is the market is selling off because yields have been going higher. It's to me, it's a little counterintuitive, but you see what's going on here. The equity market is saying, wait a second, you know, we're not priced for these higher yields and yields are not going higher. And I think this is important to sort of uh, quote the great Josh Brown. This is important. Yields are not going higher because the economy is getting better. Far from it. Yields are going higher because effectively inflation is still out of control. So we talked about a scenario where if yields went higher would be bearish. And to a certain extent, if yields start going lower, it would be bearish because in that situation, I thought they'd be going lower because the market's selling off. So here we are. You look at this chart, though, you see how far we are away from that moving average. We're talking about a couple of standard deviations. Historically, you have some sort of reversion to the mean. So what you're saying about looking like a blow off top, I would agree. So there is a very good chance that yields go lower and we trend back down to that very steep uptrend. And if we break it, we see what happens. But again, I'll say this. If yields start to go precipitously lower, what's going on to make that happen? And I would submit, and I'm not saying I'm correct, but I would submit they're going lower because we're seeing a pretty steep sell-off in the equity market. So you see how my mind's working. Other people yep. will look at this and interpret it entirely differently. But as they say, Dan, that's, that's what, what makes, makes the market. Markets. All right, Guy, well, let's just kind of take a look at what the market, the, C, uh, the Fed Fund Futures, CME's Fed Watch tool here, the next meeting that we have is going to be November can't 2nd. Wait, by the way. And Can I, I tell you something? <clears throat> I can't freaking wait. Right. It's just, well, you know, again, I said it on the show last, I'm sorry, Dan, to do this to you, but yeah. I actually said on CNBC's Fast Money last night that, you know, we, we talked about the, now the Fed comes up every night on every show. Um, yep. And Mel came to me and I said, I'll, I'll be fine. You need to know this. I'm sure most people know I am a Fed hater and I am proud of it. I am unabashed in my hatred. So it's important to get it out there because you know what I find really interesting Everybody seems to be sort of <clears throat> figuring it out on their own that maybe this federal, this all knowing Federal Reserve is not as all knowing as everybody wants to think. Anyway, yeah. please, back to you. Well, I mean, listen, you and I have slightly different of opinions here. I mean, I think, again, for people like us who sit here and stare at screens all day and have been doing it for a long time, we know that there's a lot of randomness in markets, if you will. And so the fact that they think that they control, you know, the things that they think they can control, I, I guess my view is I think about it is like how they've, um, you know, kind of reacted when we've had crises. And, and, and I know that, you know, again, a lot of criticism about what they did with the financial crisis, what Congress did with TARP and all that sort of stuff. I'm in the camp of let's do what we can do at the time when we have very little visibility and avoid, you know, the worst case scenarios as it relates to employment and as it relates to prices, their dual mandates. So to me, I mean, I get it. You know, you, you, you are a financial markets commentator. You've been in the business for 30 years. You've seen a lot of what they've done go absolutely awry. You know what I mean? You know but, what's crazy? Um, you what? actually... You rarely do this, and I yeah. love the fact, and I don't mean to interrupt yeah. because you're, everything you're saying is spot on. But typically, you obviously exaggerate in terms of my duration <laughs> in the market. And you just said 30 yeah. years. What's funny is you actually shorted me by about six. I, well, I'm you know, sorry I started about that. in 19, that's 36 yeah. years. Yeah. Oh, you know, you know what's funny though, guy, and you know, you and I have done this now for a while on CNBC and and you know, you and I've done now our podcast and market call for, you know, nearly 2 years. I mean, it's serious times, man. I it mean, is. like I, I mean, I feel like you know one of the things that's interesting that we've been talking about on all of our our stuff is that the one thing that really hasn't happened yet, we haven't seen unemployment tick up, and that's the one thing that the Fed actually needs to happen to achieve their goals here of cooling down this economy and cooling down prices. But that that's the weird thing is that mm -hmm. you know full employment's too full, and the thing is, man, when you think about what's going on with the equity markets and you think about what's going on with the housing market. If we do have unemployment tick up, let's say David Rosenberg's been saying that he sees over 5%, that means a lot of Americans are going to yep. be in a really tough spot Millions. at a time. I mean, where, what, what, but at a time when interest rates, Guy, are as high as they've been in 20 years, for all intents and purposes, and if it becomes harder to find jobs in a tighter monetary policy, that's the thing. And so I just want to go back to this November 2nd meeting, okay? We're going to be focused on corporate earnings for much of October, and maybe we're going to get you know a few more pre-announcements 
minutes in the week or two that you know before we get to earnings season. But the CME FedWatch tool is pricing about a 70% chance, okay, of a 75 basis point hike at the November 2nd meeting and also a 75% or 70 or so chance of another, um, you know, 50 in December. And so I guess my point, one week before the midterms, is there a chance if markets are lower, Guy, mm -hmm. that the Fed at least jawbones more dovish and, and really gets a rally going? Again, I know that sounds really sinister. It, it sounds political, but maybe that's what happens. Yeah, I think there's a very good chance that that happens. Without, I think Danny Moses, who you said came on, I'm sure he probably alluded to that to a certain extent as well. I think there's a very good chance that that happens. You know, if the market is cascading lower, and if in fact they raise the amount of times the Fed, the, the CME Fed Watch tool suggests that they will, there's a very good chance that the tone, the language that they use, will not only be interpreted as dovish, but will actually yeah. be dovish, which could create that year-end rally that you're talking about. No question about it. I mean, that is not without out of the realm of possibility. But let me say this. If they go down that route, correctly and incorrectly, doesn't matter. What's going to happen to commodity prices? Commodity prices, I think, are going to get back on their horse. The yeah. dollar probably gets sold off, which a lot of people say is a good thing. But the one thing you want to watch, and I'm sure you have a slide for this because we didn't talk about it prior to, but the one thing you're going to want to watch in that environment under that scenario is going to be Bitcoin, because I think that's yeah. going to unlock the potential for Bitcoin. And that's not me talking in a vacuum here. That's something we've been talking about, Dan, literally since November yeah. when the Fed changed their posture. Well, I guess with Bitcoin, though, I, I would also say just much like you think that, you know, equities could rally a year from now. I think it probably happens from lower levels of sentiment. Could not be worse. The use cases seem hard to find here. Um, and, you know, all these guys on Twitter, and they're mostly guys, took off their laser eyes, guys. So maybe we're we're close to there. But it obviously, I think the dollar is a really important part of that. And let's let's talk about this move because you were over there in Italy for two weeks when... No, 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 no. no, no. Oh, Sicily. I'm Bang, sorry. I'm sorry. But they do but they do use the euro over there, guy. And the yeah, euro, which was making new lows. I mean, I was in Italy earlier this year in August, and it it really is amazing that you know if a coke costs a dollar here a, a coke is costing a euro over there and that is something that most you know americans have not been accustomed to now that only matters really when you're purchasing things outside the u.s but you've used this expression a lot and morgan stanley used it here and we have a little slide here morgan stanley sees dollar surge setting the stage for something to break and danny's also used that and you know you've been saying that also about the treasury market and yields and just the volatility that we've seen and things really do seem like they're getting um, a little heightened away from equities and some of these other risk assets, which are much bigger markets than equities. Much. So, so talk to me a little bit because this quote, and, and I'll just leave it to you here. This is from Morgan Stanley. In our view, such an outcome is exactly how something does break, which leads to a major top for the US dollar and maybe rates too. This is Mike Wilson, friend of ours, friend of the pod here. And, um, you know, I, I'll just say this. I'm positioned last week, you, you were not on a market call. I'm actually short the UUP and I'm actually long the GOVT. So I'm playing for yields to come in. And those are two trades that are hurting me right now because we are seeing some serious blow offs yeah. in both of those. If you throw the, the US dollar index up there. I think you knew when you put them on though, there was a chance you weren't gonna catch the absolute top. And you yeah. realize in this environment, you know, you might be a couple days early, but I do think these positions are gonna pay off for you if you have sort of the fortitude to stay with them. And it is painful now, but in terms of what Mike Wilson said, who by the way, you know, really got under a lot of criticism for a long time for a lot of his calls that most, if not all, yeah. are coming to fruition right before our very eyes. So he's done a remarkable job. And as you mentioned, he's been on market call, he's been on the tape with us. So good for him for sticking to his guns. And it was because of the thoughtful work that him and his entire team do. With that said, the currency moves that we're seeing now in developed nations, in currencies of the United States, obviously Great Britain, all through some of the developed nations of Europe, are moves you typically would see in third world currencies. And the moves that we see that are taking place in the course of out, literally hours, Dan, usually in my tenure took place over the course of weeks, if not longer. The mechanism is broken and at a certain point, something's got to give the market governments corporations are not set up for moves of these magnitudes in my opinion and listen 
If you don't believe me, read the Morgan Stanley piece. Go and look what the Bank of Japan did for the first – I'm sure you talked about it last week. Yeah. For the first time in a couple decades, you had central bank intervention in terms of the dollar-yen. It's Things are happening now that you haven't seen in terms of currencies – Maybe in history, and I'm not trying to be hyperbolic here. So, yeah, something's got to break before it figures it out. But the currency moves are not good. The, the bond moves are ridiculous. And th that's a word I've used now literally for the last 18 months. I think people are coming to that realization. And it's just a matter of time. It's something I've been saying. I'm surprised it's taken this long to manifest itself into equities. Yeah. So, you know, in, in the last, let's call it nine or 10 months since, you know, um, the dollar started taking off and when crude was taking off, we've thrown up a chart and we don't have it here today, but it, it was the dollar versus um, yeah, crude oil. And one of the things that I just, again, you know, I'm a bit of a creature of habit. I am a stock market guy. I like to look at single names. I also trade um, a lot of sector ETFs, but I, I don't style myself as some fancy macro trader here but one of the things that i remember you know all too well was in 2013 and 2014 when the fed you know was contemplating tapering you know their bond purchases and coming off a zero interest rate policy well the u.s dollar started to rally because when they weakened or when they lowered interest rates they were trying to weaken the dollar right and and that was a big function this is in the wake of the financial crisis here but when the inverse was happening when they were contemplating you know raising interest rates we had that little taper tantrum in hindsight that was really cute but man oh man guy when you think about crude oil and the rally that it had after the financial crisis because all the stimulus that the chinese were doing when the dollar really started to rally the u.s dollar index went from 80 to 100 what happened to crude oil in 14 and 15 it was down 65 percent and this is at a time where global growth was reflating and that's one of the reasons why i want to go back to this crude chart here because you know look at all of the volatility that we had upward right when we had the end of the war in europe and then we had that one last push in the summer but since then it's been 120 to 78 we're sitting on a trend line going back you know um you know a couple years here thoughts on crude guy because again you just mentioned what you think could happen a year from now but it really feels like we are going to have spotty global growth for for maybe a year or two to come what's that expression when you <clears throat> when you um give somebody praise you blow smoke up his or her um I don't yeah know. you know so, well yeah, yeah. but yeah, so yeah. Th i'm about to do that to you oh. you know whether you realize it or not but what's you've been saying exactly what's taking place <laughs> literally since i want to say the spring if not before that number one number two and i'm only mentioning that because today goldman sachs basically came out and did their mea culpa in terms of oil saying that they misunderstood or sort of underestimated the power of exactly what you're talking about, what currencies have meant and how the underlying commodity was going to trade. So that's a great job by you. You know, Goldman gets, I mean, that's the only thing that this team does is focus on commodities and they got yeah. it dead wrong or to, they've gotten it wrong to this point. So we'll see. That trend line's the right trend line. Again, you know, we're about a standard deviation or so away from the moving average, which we'll see if we have some mean reversion there. But yeah. Again, in the, in a world of global growth slowing down, although we have not seen demand destruction yet, I guess what the crude oil market is telling you is it's just a matter of time before you do. So yeah. I think the the commodity has sort of been front running what is inevitable to happen. Well, you know, it's funny. You talk about mean reversion. And again, I mean, I think that's really what we saw. Uh, you know, from the dollar, from crude, from rates. This is back, let's call it, you know, six, seven years ago. And that's kind of what I was kind of keying off here too. And you made the point when I said like, yeah, I'm getting hurt on this UUP short, this ETF that tracks the US dollar index. I think it will mean revert. I think it will come back to that uptrend. I think it will be a good trade. I was early, yields, same thing. You know, I do think that it, this is going to be a bit of a blow off top because I do think that November 2nd, I think there's a really good chance. And we're going to see maybe a week before that a trial balloon in the Wall Street mm -hmm. Journal by the Fed whisperer suggesting that, OK, well, maybe the Fed's starting to see some of the things where they can kind of do 75 basis points next week and be done. Well, rates will move in front of that, right? You know what I mean? So that's why I'm targeting November in the options market. Kind of, this is the only way I know how to trade these sorts of risk assets, especially at a time where it's becoming increasingly hard guy to figure out what stocks are the ones to buy or sell here because stocks are not acting particularly rationally. And I know while you were gone, FedEx had a really bad pre-announcement. Oh I know, but guy, look at this thing. It just keeps going lower. Every 
every yeah. day. And so that just makes you worried about buying any dip in any individual name. But listen, I mean, talking about being wrong in something, I'll raise my hand in terms of Federal Express because that was catastrophic. Yeah. I mean, and that comes in the wake of them saying completely, I know you talked about it, so I apologize, but I mean, their rhetoric changed basically an entire 180 from about a month or so, probably three weeks or so prior. I mean, that was a disaster. And quite frankly, I think a lot of that is a FedEx problem. I just think they're just not being run particularly well. But to your point, I mean, I think a lot of it is what's going on globally. And just real quickly in terms of uh, mean reversion, you, you knew when you got into some of these trades, because we yeah. all have done it, you, you're not going to nail it in terms of timing. It's just a question of, is your thesis right? And I think your thesis is going to be exactly right. And real quick, you mentioned them, the, the central banks or the Federal Reserve putting yeah. out a trial balloon uh, the last week of October. So they put out a trial balloon today. I think it was Bullard or somebody who said, somebody said something about being a little concerned about the speed with which they're moving. And that was clearly a trial balloon. Yeah. And I'll tell you that, this, that's why the market, I think, opened up some 300 or so Dow points. Yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, listen, I think that, again, we also run the risk of like, you know, in June, we had that crescendo lower, you know, over the last two weeks, we've had a down, what, 11% move in the S&P 500. The last time we had a move like that was in June when, when it was this perceived out of that Fed meeting that we might get a pivot. And again, I don't think that's great stuff to make big investment decisions about. I think if you're trading, I think it makes sense here. I also think it makes sense that if we go through the lows in a meaningful way, and let's just talk about this reversal today, guy. I mean, the longer we stay down, mm -hmm. Yeah, after that gap opening, the more likely it is to get ugly late in the day. I don't know how they save them unless there was some sort of headline that causes yields to come in a lot. I mean, so to me, it's a really dicey spot for stocks. But that all being said, one of the one of the fuel to that equity rally or one of the big parts of the fuel is that estimates have been coming down for individual names, you know, into their Q2 prints in late July. And when things weren't as bad as people thought, that's when they thought it was the all clear to buy stocks. It's in, thank you for bringing that up. Absolutely. So, you know, you beat lowered estimates, so the market yeah. rallies. And I don't want to dwell on this, but, you know, I think I get shit wrong all the time. I mean, without question. Yeah. If you watch Fast Money in the course of a week, if not 16 or so years, you know that I'm wrong a lot. But in terms of Microsoft, just as a one-off, I bring this up for a reason because, <clears throat> you know, you remember when they reported their earnings release, and we've talked about it here, and I'll go over it quickly. I mean, the stock closed that day around 255. It was a shitty earnings release. The stock traded down to 242 in the post market. They said basically they're not seeing demand destruction. The stock then proceeded to go to 290 over the course of the next few weeks, along with a broader market rally. And it didn't make any sense based on that quarter. Now we see Microsoft is lower than the lows they made post market after earnings release. It speaks to exactly that. Yeah, you can beat lowered expectations, but at a certain point, the market figures out wait a second. It's still a lousy quarter. And that's a one-off without question, but it makes a lot of sense. All right, last thing, if we're talking single names here, you know, one of the stocks I see green on my screen, and it was up nearly 2% earlier is Apple. It's trading 151 in a quarter. And you think of that as, you know, 13% or so of the NASDAQ 100 guy. It has been a flight to safety. Mm -hmm. There's been very few stocks, especially as you mentioned, Microsoft making new 52-week lows. One of the things that's interesting about Microsoft is that's 10% of the NASDAQ 100. Mm -hmm. Apple's 14%. If Apple were to go back down, let's say to 140 or near its previous lows, 136 or something, the NASDAQ is going down for the count. And the QQQ, the NASDAQ 100, however you want to look at it, is less than 1% away from that June 16th intraday low. And all it's going to take is Apple to join the party of the downside. And I don't give a crap if you tell me that there's going to be a lot of stocks that are down 70, 80% that start to show relative strength. That's good. Okay. I'm happy if that's your game here. But until those stocks bottom, and let's throw in Tesla, which is also like suspended animation. I mean, if that joins the party, the new the, the Nasdaq 100 has got new lows. Sounds like I think that was a song by Pink Floyd, suspended animation, a state yeah. of bliss that yeah. Apple owners find themselves in, at least today. But Dan, if I told you a company had, you know, mid single digits earnings growth, mid single digits revenue growth, <laughs> declining margins, um, and was trading at 26 times next year's numbers, you'd say, wait a second, something doesn't make sense, and you'd yeah. be right. And that stock would be 
Apple. And listen, I get it. It's a great company. Well, yay, we, uh, we wait online and stuff. Good for you. If you're waiting online at an Apple store, by the way, you got to reevaluate everything you're doing in life, okay? Just I'm putting yeah. it out there just because. With that said, I mean, it's an expensive stock. And to your point, at a certain point, that's going to be the last general to fall, to quote the great Carter Braxton Worth. All right. Speaking of falling, you enjoy I that, I, by the way? I, yeah, I, I really did. It, it, it is so good to have you back, my main man. I think our, our viewers were kind of getting sick nah, of it. hearing my voice. They probably loved hearing the dulcet tones of Carter Worth. Um, and we had a lot of fun uh, doing all of it, but it's great to have you back, Guy Diamond. We covered a lot of ground um, today. Why don't you take us out here, buddy? I will. I heard Carter's son joined the market. Oh, coach. man, it was so fun good. yesterday. Yeah. But I will take us out. So, look, that's it. 30 minutes like that, like like Butter. By the way, Butters will be with us, I believe, in terms of his work on Thursday. I always look yep. forward to that. Yep. I want to thank a CME group, again, Dan, where risk meets opportunity. And by the way, what month is this? September, October, November, we got something coming for you uh, in the form of the CME, but we'll talk about it as we get closer. I want to thank uh, Open Exchange for powering us, as they always do. And if you like our show, if you enjoy it, Dan, what do you want to do? You want to leave a comment? We do like yeah. to hear from you. Amanda Diaz, I, see, I just call her AD. AD. She loves reading all this stuff. We get it. We try to respond to everything, good and or bad. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow with Carter Braxtonworth, the aforementioned, and the great Tom Sosnoff of Tasty Trade. Wednesdays are fun day at Carvel. Well, the Wednesdays are fun day here at MKT Call. New graphic package coming, by the way, Dan. Did I say that right? <laughs> yeah, you did. All right, man. Great to have you back, guy. Uh, we'll see you all tomorrow. Thanks a lot. Uh.